Well, what a great start uh, we had, starting with uh, uh, opening worship together. And thanks, Bishop Peter, who's somewhere oh, over there. Thanks, Peter, for being with us and for, uh, for sharing with us this morning. Uh, I, too, want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, those people who hold the songs and the stories and the memories of this place uh, through many, many generations. And my hunch is that along these coastal areas, people have met for thousands of years uh, to tell stories and to come together to do important work. And so we, uh, we pay our respects to those traditional owners of the past, but also those current uh, traditional owners who hold those uh, important parts of culture for the emerging generations. Um, thank you in advance to the team who have uh, worked so hard to bring the conference together. Um, the great joy for me is that after this session, uh, I can relax and change my shirt and uh, just come along for the ride until Thursday. So uh, I really appreciate having the space to be with you all uh, as we gather together. I am eight months and three days into the role of being Archbishop. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> and at the very beginning I said that probably the best I'd be able to do was to get up and to show up and to do that as fully and faithfully as I could. And, uh, and eight months and three days on, um, I'm still here, still getting up, still showing up, still doing it as faithfully as I can in company with uh, all of you and some others as together we seek to discern where the Spirit is leading us in this next season of our life together. I'm working through all of the firsts, yeah, the first Christmas and first Easter as Archbishop, First consecration, that came pretty early on, that was pretty terrific. First synod, and now uh, my first provincial conference as Archbishop. And so um, it's fantastic to be here uh, with you today. I was saying to Chris, who's on after me, I probably don't need the 45 minutes, so if he wants to expand his 32 minutes, um, yeah, there's a bit of grace there. Let me begin. Can joy be found in crumpled hearts, in empty rooms and broken parts? Can it be found in desert earth, in washed up dreams and faded worth? Can joy come when the rain outweighs the happy, blissful, sunny days? Or in the middle of our grief with words held, held tight between our teeth? Can joy be found in trembling hands where nothing but the unknown stands? Where the unthinkable comes true and changes everything we knew? I wonder if joy even knows how to emerge when sorrow grows. Does it lay down beside the bed and still caress our weary head? And is joy really brave enough to walk along when things get tough? Is joy right there before our eyes but stuck? between our heavy sighs. I hear joy say that it's okay to feel both joy and pain today. Whatever loss or lacking light, joy finds a way to make, our, to make us bright. You see, our lanterns glow the best when darkness comes to steal our rest. And just when sadness seems to win, joy trickles in. 
I don't know about you, but that's often my experience of joy. Despite everything, joy trickles in. Not uh, always the raucous, noisy joy of winning a gold medal or a grand final, but joy like the small, still voice of God that trickles in and brings me hope. And it's not a sort of Pollyanna-ish, rose-tinted glasses kind of joy that pretends all of the problems of the world and my life are solved or don't exist. Mostly, it's a bit closer to something like a glimpse of grace, often unexpected, that reframes things in a way that brings life. The wonderful Australian writer Helen Garner put it like this, what is joy anyway? Does anybody know? It's taken me 80 years to figure out that it's not a tranquil, sunlit realm at the top of the ladder you've spent your whole life hauling yourself up, rung by rung. It's more like that thing that Christians call grace. You can't earn it. You can't strive for it. It's not a reward for virtue. It exists all right, she says, it will be given to you, but it's fluid, it's evasive, it's out of reach. It's something you glimpse in the corner of your eye until one day you're up to your neck in it. It's a, it's a great uh, description both of grace and of joy. And the thing about joy is that it rarely comes in isolation. Uh, There's a terrific study that I've uh, uh, talked about a number of times before uh, done in a university in Switzerland uh, where a professor of psychology took an interest in how people feasted and celebrated. And as part of his research, he asked one of his students to uh, write about how children aged between nine and 11, experienced the phenomenon of a feast. And so the student approached the the question in a number of ways. One of those ways consisted of showing a sample group of children three different drawings of a birthday feast. And in the first picture, there was a child by themselves but with a mountain of gifts and presents, all waiting to be opened. In the second drawing, the child was not alone. There were a few presents and a few members of the family, but there was food, cake, ice cream, and all sorts of other things, but far fewer presents to open. In fact, there was actually only one, and not a very big one. In the third drawing, the child was surrounded by family, friends and neighbours and there was a whole lot of food, but there were no presents, nothing to open. And the question the the children were asked was simple. Which of these three birthday feasts would you rather have for yourself and why? 70% of the children chose the third drawing. They said, this is the real feast. Because in the third drawing, everyone's happy. In the first drawing, I'm the only one that's happy. And in the second drawing, not enough people are happy. And reflecting on this, one writer says that the children grasped something authentic about joy. That only by being together can we truly discover what joy is all about. You know, a true feast in Christian thinking is communion with God and communion with people. The two are indivisible. Communion with God and communion with people. That is where 
we might actually get a sense of shared joy. And of course, we are all deeply aware of the challenge of being in communion when we don't have a sense of common purpose. Every occasion of joy I can think of is linked to an experience of connection, of being with others. The artist Jan Richardson says, if I were to make a map of my joys, to trace a path of the points where it has entered my life, every X on that map would mark a location where some kind of relationship has been at work where I've connected with another person or where I've been visited with an understanding that I belonged to something larger than myself and I knew in my bones that I was not alone. Because like the children in that study knew, joy loves company. It depends on relationships. It depends on becoming larger than itself. It depends on finding a common purpose together. But I think like the poem I began with suggests, there's a complexity around joy in a world where there's so much sadness. We have to look again and again to those around us to find a sense of shared purpose so that together we might glimpse the joy that we're being invited to. Jan Richardson continues, when Elizabeth calls out in welcome to Mary and the child she is carrying leaps with joy, when Mary raises her voice in the Magnificat, when Zechariah sings his canticle, when Mary and Joseph bring the infant Jesus to the temple, and the prophets Anna and Simeon cry out in recognition and delight. In every case, these people are not unmindful of the state of the world. Each one gives the impression that the joy that courses through them, that radiates from them, is a habit and a practice that it's something to which they have routinely made themselves available, not by resisting the world, but by entering more deeply into it. And by entering more deeply into the relationships they've formed with those around them, so that they can even better welcome the God who shows up in the midst of it. And this kind of joy that recognises the realities of the world doesn't come from a sort of naivety or from ignoring what makes this life ha hard. It glimpses in connection with other people something that brings life and hope and the possibility of transformation, even in the midst of the strife and challenge and heartache of our world. And this is the joy that echoes through the scriptures. Joy in company with others, even amidst the brokenness of our world. Magi, who were overwhelmed with joy when they saw where the star had stopped. Friends who left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell the other disciples the news of the resurrection. The promise to Zechariah of joy and gladness. Elizabeth's declaration that as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. The angel's proclamation, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. And the 72 who returned with joy after seeing amazing things. And finally, the promise from Jesus to the disciples that even though you have pain now, I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. 
So joy doesn't happen in a vacuum. It always comes in company with others. And mostly it comes when we find a common purpose, when we enrich and deepen our relationships and find ways of travelling together. Some of you know pub choir. Uh, Astrid Jorgensen, the founding director of pub choir, says this about this, uh, this great phenomenon that started in Brisbane a few years ago. She says, in every city, the audience has a different energy, but the concept is universal. People like making stuff together and they just need to be told that they're okay even if they're really shit. <laughs> it's so fine if you're not the best part because it's impossible to be the best at singing, so it's all okay. You know, the first time I went to pub choir, what struck me was the way through, almost through sheer force of will and skill and personality, Jorgensen creates this kind of living, breathing force that fills the room with joy for two hours. One article in The Australian describes it like this, you know, once the high ladies give their first full rendition of their part, the crowd erupts with impressed cheers. Sensing the momentum, Jorgensen pushes them on, riding every note and melodic line like a jockey on a winner. It's the power of hundreds of voices singing as one, belting out a few lines and a winning melody with which most Australians are familiar. It's the emotional impact of using an instrument that we all carry yet rarely feel confident enough to use around others. It sounds fantastic and the group knows it. The mood is ebullient as everyone in the room rides an extraordinary natural high that can be only achieved through sharing something together in complete joy. 2,000 strangers in a room, perhaps with a beer in hand, but a common purpose and a joy that fills the room for two hours. It's a remarkable thing. Imagine if we could sort ourselves out as a church and find again the common purpose that drew us to faith in the first place. Find again our voice and perhaps some of the harmonies that are so often obscured because we'd much rather argue with each other. And of course, you know, we do get glimpses of who and what we could be. Yeah, those, those rare moments when, as a church, we can all enthusiastically sing from the same song sheet or pray the same prayer or simply join with conviction in an amen. And so perhaps we need to be called back time and time again to the experience of our God who captivated our hearts in the first place and get better at speaking that aloud, at sharing that with each other, at deepening our relationships around a common purpose. In her little book, um, Christianity for the Rest of Us, written about 20 years ago or so, Diana Butler Bass talked about 10 signposts of renewal, 10 things common amongst mainline congregations in the United States that were growing. One of those things was testimony, the practice of sharing what God is doing in your life. And it's something that we need to practice because most of us are not very good at it. But she writes about one particular congregation, the Church of the Redeemer in the shadow of Yale Divinity School. She says, it was risky for a minister to open space for people's words, authentic and deeply personal in the midst of worship. It takes a lot of trust to let go. 
to create safe space for the spirit, to help people speak what is in their souls, to risk deepening relationships. She goes on, a student from Yale said, testimony changed my preaching and reshaped the community. It gave voice to our diversity. Yet, at the same time, in listening to to and respecting that diversity, we found common purpose and and the Holy Spirit knit us together. Diana finishes the chapter. Unlike the stories of Puritans and revivalists, mainline testimony is not a spirituality of of arrival, of the certainty of securing eternal life. She says, mainline testimony is the act of getting there, of being surprised by God's love and transformed in unanticipated ways. They are pilgrimage stories, stories of people on the way. And she says, and in telling those stories, we always find that we're not alone on the journey. There are other pilgrims on the road as well. Pilgrims have always told stories as they travel. And in those stories, trust is built. Relationships are deepened. And we might just discover joy in someone else's experience, even as they discover joy in ours. And we might discover something of God's love and the possibility of being transformed. Common purpose, shared joy. Those of you who know me will know that I really struggle to be interested in sport. I work really hard at it. Um, I uh, went to dinner at St John's College at UQ the other week and Anne Joseph told me there was a speaker from the Lions Club coming and I thought that's terrific that these young people are going to learn about community service, (laughs) how to be involved in a group that's really struggling for membership. Very exciting. And she said, no, no, the Lions Club, the Brisbane Lions. I knew enough not to ask if that was rugby or AFL. (laughs) The gift of having a chaplain like Howard is he was able to sit me down and give me an intense briefing. (laughs) So I was able to say to the guest speaker when he arrived, 270 games, that's terrific. Do you think you'll make 300? And the swans, there at the top of the table. <laughs> I've got no idea what that means, but he was impressed. <laughs> Thankfully, he didn't ask me any questions about football. But I did enjoy some of the Olympics, and, uh, and I loved this piece from the ABC a couple of weeks ago during the Olympics. Joy is addictive. Through the murky haze of world events that creeps ever steadily into our news cycles, the glint of gold sparkling through the mire has become habitual morning reading through these Paris Olympics. It's a joy of shared experience, of waking up every morning to see which Australian has won this time and texting friends and family to radiate in the warmth together. And it said, this morning, that joy came via a 14-year-old skateboarder. Even I was touched by that moment. And joy is addictive. It's infectious. The joy of shared experience, of waking up every morning to see which Australian has won this time and texting friends and family to radiate in the warmth together. I'll start break dancing in a minute, Quinn. That's okay. 
Over the next few days, uh, we've got a great opportunity. Um, of course, we've got the opportunity to hear from some terrific speakers. Bishop Vicentia knows well the depths of joy that can be found even amidst great challenges. Archdeacon Miranda knows the joy that comes from a deep engagement with the scriptures. And all of our other speakers bring their own lens to the theme of the conference. But we also have the opportunity to rediscover something of our common purpose as we meet and talk and pray and worship together. What might it mean for us if we could rediscover with joy those things we hold in common and celebrate those things and actually delight in each other as we do so. What might that mean for us in this season of our life as a church if we lived out of that place rather than a place of constant suspicion and division? And how differently might others see us if we really were a people of common purpose and shared joy? The wonderful poet Wendell Berry wrote, the question before me now that I am old is not how to be dead, which I know from enough practice, but how to be alive. And my hunch is that to be really alive is to know both the sorrow and the joy of life. But how much better it is to know joy in company with others when you really can celebrate a common purpose. Mary Oliver says, if you suddenly and unexpectedly feel joy, don't hesitate, give in to it. There are plenty of lives and whole towns destroyed or about to be. We're not wise and not very often kind. And there's much that can never be redeemed. Still, life has some possibility left. Perhaps this is its way of fighting back, that sometimes something happens better than all the riches or power in the world. It could be anything. But very likely you notice it in the instant when love begins. Anyway, that's often the case. Anyway, whatever it is, don't be afraid of its plenty. Joy is not made to be a crumb. Imagine if church was like that. I know Stephen Schwartzrock was there and I was there. Um, I don't know if you saw either of us. Uh, Richard was there. Um, excellent. Um, common purpose, shared joy. Uh, you can't strive for it. It's not a reward for virtue. It exists all right. It's something you glimpse in the corner of your eye until one day you're up to your neck in it like the grace of God. So it's terrific that so many of you have come to be here for these few days. I'm really pleased uh, to be part of it all. I look forward to the conversations, to the speakers, and to just hanging out together um, and rediscovering some of that joy um, that maybe some of us um, had a glimpse of that brought us to faith in the first place. Thank you very much. Thank you.